Hello, everyone. Welcome to Go Global World GGW Sharks 22nd event. And today, this is LGBTQ event specifically for the Pride Coast and for supporting the LGBTQ community. We are so excited that this is happening and we are getting, getting this chance to support uh, uh, these people. And this is why we made this uh, day special. We uh, invited uh, investors who are investing specifically in LGBTQ founders, and we invited uh, as many as we could uh, LGBTQ founders. So that's going to be awesome. We're going to have fun. Let's uh, enjoy it. Let's debate and uh, let's make this a special day for all of you. So this show is not mine. This show is yours. The more organized we are, the more fun and results we would have. And this is why I'm not going to speak much. I will just show a few slides about what Go Google World does. Then I present the investors and the rules. And then I let investors to present themselves in broader details so you know who you're talking to. And we will jump right into it. Go Google World is the community and a digital SaaS platform for startups and investors. For investors, uh, we save time connecting uh, them with the right founders. Uh, on our platform and also uh, we, are, we are helping them to automate their uh, external funding request. Founders reach out via email, LinkedIn and all kinds of messengers and sometimes investors are overwhelmed with the amount of communication they receive and many founders get uh, ignored uh, and many of them good uh, just not because the founders are bad, investors are overwhelmed with information. What we are offering is automating this external inbound funding request. So we, uh, investors are saying 99% of uh, these requests are irrelevant. So finding this 1% is a challenge for them. So what we do, we just automate this. We take this 99% and show only one of those who are relevant automatically. So investors don't do many work anymore. And in, uh, this 99% we compare to the rest of the investors' criteria and match with them. And then we take the other 99% from those investors and compare this with criteria of the first investor. So instead of 1%, they get 5, 10%, and it's automatic. You just need to create your good investor profile. Then um, you will have your uh, investor page. So you probably uh, can refer to LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is about career. This is your personal investor page where this is not just uh, your finding information in particular, which is already awesome to have your personal, not just your fund, but your personal as an investor, what exactly founders you're looking for. And there is a, an active button co uh, called apply for finding where founders can apply. You share with them your link, they see your criteria, but also they apply for finding and the system is automatically processing and give the founders answer on your behalf automatically, almost instantly. And you get notified of any relevant uh, uh, startup that you were looking for and they match your criteria. So it just, the magic is just starts here, but it's just the beginning. Now, the founders also have one pagers uh, that they can share with investors instead of doing this PDF one pager, then the pitch deck link, then something else and a lot of text and uh, investors just read it and just overwhelmed. Here is the beautiful one pager uh, that uh, with a brand new link that founders can share with all key information, including the video pitch for 60 seconds, and the fundraising situation where investors can have a look and take a decision within seconds or minutes whether they should connect or they shouldn't. So this information was verified with many investors. That's why we don't uh, overwhelm founders with uh, uh, creating uh, their uh, profiles, uh, filling, out, filling out so much forms with endless uh, questions. So only to the point saving time for founders and investors. Now on the platform, if you register, then the magic starts here even in a broader way. So we are matching the right investors with the right startups. We're putting for you first in the most relevant people. And we are not connecting just the record in the database with the record on the database. Everyone is verified and only real people connect. It's not like cold uh, connections. That's why uh, both sides need to decide either pass or connect. And if we have a mutual connect request, then the, uh, the match happening, the chat gets activated and you can talk. So you will talk only with warm connections you wanted to connect. Now, that's it on my end. And I'm announcing the GGW LGBTQ Sharks event right now. Who are the investors today? We have an amazing panel of uh, 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 investors uh, and I'm just name them uh, right now. And then I let them present themselves. Kadi Findling. Uh, she is from uh, the, uh, the Netherlands uh, uh, and uh, uh, 
so she she is from uh, Chasing Rainbow. Uh, Christian McKinsey uh, from uh, Blockchain Value Ventures. Ben Stokes, um, uh, he is uh, uh, from also Chasing Rainbow, and he's by the way based in Australia right now, so he's late. Uh, Chris uh, hasn't joined yet, but he's about to join, so we will let him join. And uh, Jeffrey Martinez, uh, Diversity Venture Capital, and Marika Baselmans uh, from Asif Ventures. So I might not remember all the locations, but uh, it doesn't matter. The people will say, the investors will say where they're based right now. It's like right, literally in, uh, in the West Coast, in the East Coast, in the middle of the US, in Mexico, and in Australia, and in Europe right now. This is the amazing investor founders panel we have investing in LGBTQ uh, founders. Okay, I will let them present in a second, but the rules, the rules are so important. Uh, that's why uh, with these rules, we can keep this event organized and get the result for most of you. Now, keep yourself muted all the time, please. It's so important. So you don't interrupt others uh, who are presenting. And uh, uh, investors, of course, they will keep them on mute all the time because the, the investors are the main people on the show uh, connecting with you guys. Now, uh, raise your hand to pitch. If you want to pitch, you will get two minutes uh, uh, elevator pitch with questions. So without slides, we don't allow slides here. We are connecting humans with humans. And uh, that's important that you are giving your story from first hands. Um, if you are existing uh, uh, subscribe member uh, on any plan at Go Global World, you will be pitching Monday first. If you didn't pitch last time, you also get a priority to pitch. And we will announce every founder who is pitching next. And please respect time. It's a, max, a maximum two hours event. Uh, uh, so we are going to be here up to two hours. Maybe we finish early, it doesn't matter. Uh, and if uh, it would happen that uh, somebody wouldn't uh, get a chance to pitch, we will let them pitch in the next uh, following event. And this is not only the pitch event. We also have investors in the chat uh, uh, beyond those who are on the panel. So you can network, you can pitch in the chat as well. Uh, use this every opportunity and more important please don't sell anything to each other please support each other this is not a place to sell this is a place to actually achieve results getting funded getting connections so use every opportunity for that finally if you want to do an ideal two-minute elevator pitch for the investors this is how it usually works the best way keep it as a story get to the point of what you do and why you are unique and of course tell investors about your traction because i mean without traction it's not so attractive tell us this and if you pitch before tell us what has significantly changed since you pitched last time that's it on my end this is the context of go global world uh, go on our website to create your profile and of course uh, create uh, reach out to us by info at global.world that's it and let's present the investors. So let's start with uh, uh, Ben. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Ben Stokes and I'm the founding partner of Chasing Rainbows. Um, Chasing Rainbows is an early stage venture fund which invests purely in LGBTQ plus founded companies as a way of creating greater access to capital. Uh, so we're a sector agnostic. We write checks from 50 to 250K. Um, and ultimately our goal is to, to help you get to that next round of funding. Fantastic. Awesome to have you. And uh, Jeffrey, you'll be next. Jeffrey, your microphone. <laughs> Murphy's Law. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeffrey from Diversity VC. Uh, we write slightly smaller checks than Ben, um, 10,000 to 150,000. And we're we look at diversity as a moving target. Um, so we really like to get to know our founders and hopefully partner um, on those early ventures. I'll uh, leave it, oh, give it over to Chris. Awesome. Great to have you, Jeff. Uh, Chris, your turn. Uh, Chris Davidsinger, I wish I was the founding partner of Chasing Rainbows, uh, but I am the uh, head of the Startout Growth Lab. Uh, ben, good to see you. Um, Startout, for those of you that don't know, is the uh, world's largest nonprofit supporting LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs, and I run our Growth Lab. Our Growth Lab, yes, high five. We love it. Our Growth Lab is a five-month accelerator program where we kind of run you through uh, what we think is hopefully best of breed curriculum and programming. Um, if you don't know about it, please go into my bio. We are taking applications for cohort number 12 due uh, June 30th, so there's still time to apply. 
We've had 11 cohorts. Of those 11 cohorts, we've raised upon graduation $763 million. And um, those companies have created over 3,000 jobs. So we like to think that we have created and added some value. So please, uh, I'm here hopefully trying to get some people into the next cohort. So uh, ask some questions, find me on LinkedIn, and honored to be here. Be honored to have you. And everyone, uh, feel free to apply to Chris' program. Uh, Chris will probably share some details in the chat so you guys can directly apply. Uh, awesome to have you. And we support every investor. If you guys have any announcement on your end, please do so. We are happy to support. Um, Kadi, uh, your turn. Katie, uh, Katie Fenlane, um, I can attest that Startout is a phenomenal organization. I've served on the board for five years, so I'm the Access to, Cap Access to Capital co-chair. I serve with Ben also at Chasing Rainbows. Ben gave her a little spiel so and killed it. Um, I also represent a firm called uh, Startup Group. I'm an associate there, so just it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to have you as well. Thank you. Marika, your turn. Hi, uh, good evening, or at least for me, at least uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm working currently at the uh, Asia Ventures, which is a pre seed uh, French capital fund. Ticket size is 25K to 100K, located in Amsterdam. Um, and I'm currently responsible for finance and operations within the PC fund. Thank you so much. Great to have you in the Netherlands. That's awesome. Chris, uh, and uh, you will be the final person before we get started. Everyone, um, great to be here. My name's Chris. I am an associate at Red Cedar Ventures. We are a pre seed fund in the Midwest. Um, we have a geo focus on the Midwest and we are industry agnostic. So, looking forward to hearing all the presentations today. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we are getting started right now. And the first person uh, is to present would be Jeremy O'Brien. Jeremy, you ready? Jeremy O'Brien. Yes, I am ready. Okay, you got two minutes. Go for it. Okay. No slides. Right, right, understood. Hi, everybody. I'd like you to close your eyes and picture this. A thriving education sector empowered by innovative technology transforming millions of lives worldwide. At Emerge Global, we're making that vision a reality with our Centurion Solutions, spearheaded by me, accomplished entrepreneur and professor at USC, fight on, we're changing the face of education in the edtech industry. The edtech sector is projected to skyrocket to a staggering 404 billion by 2025. So this colossal growth is very challenging and that's where we step in. We offer comprehensive digital marketing and consulting services, helping businesses improve, scale, break new ground. Our end-to-end -end solutions encompass strategic planning, leadership cultivation, performance optimization, and much more. We are also pioneers in offering C-suite, fractional C-suite services, bringing in the, uh, the biggest and brightest minds in the industry to offer strategic guidance. We offer holistic partnership, including all of the above, as well as networking events for our clients to connect to the who's who of the ed tech and education sector. All of our contracts are backed by a performance improvement guarantee, demonstrating our commitment to success. So, our Grand Slam offer is a bundle of our premier services delivering unprecedented value at a competitive price point. Each component is market proven, providing an irresistible proposition to prospective clients. So we're not just another consulting firm, we're catalysts propelling EdTech to new heights. We've already delivered quantifiable improvements for our clients, sales surge by 35%, operational cost decreased by 20%, and time to market have. As we emerge from COVID-19, the need for our services have never been greater. Businesses are seeking ways to optimize their, uh, their remote work environments and incentivize employees to come back into the office. With our expertise, they can not only achieve those goals, but they can also ensure a prosperous future. We are Emerge Global, the new standard in EdTech consulting. With our proven strategies and in your investment, we can revolutionize EdTech together. Join us on this transformative journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Sharks, your questions. Are you in or out? Who wants to start? Ben would like to start? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, 
yeah no it, it, it sounds uh it sounds interesting um one quick question i have for you is is there a particular area that you're focused on within edtech or is it um you know across all sorts of education levels uh well i would say we primarily have focused on startups and mid-sized companies to come in and help consult scale their their businesses optimize their systems but we also go into university proper and work with the individual schools for example at my school at usc we've worked with half a dozen schools on the campus to optimize their systems to get their online presence up running and working both nationally and internationally cool great then I can pop it next. Um, so question for you, how is it a, you know, how do you scale this? Because it also sounds like it's a consulting type base at the moment. So I'm assuming that's where you are now, but I have concerns about that. Well, we, we've, we've scaled by uh, ultimately adding more experts to our team. The fractional C-suite, I think, is where we, excel in the scale because we don't need full-time people to go in we we ultimately have three offers where we can teach you coach you and then do it for you and so we have these three tier options and a lot of people opt for the teaching and so we have a team that can go in and teach we have a team that can go in and coach and then if you want us to do it for you then we have a team that can come in and completely do it for you so i think to answer that question in a, in a more concise way it's we add more people as we need All right. Follow on question. Um, how many revenue streams do you have? Uh, currently, we have eight revenue streams. Which include really fast breakdown. Um, we have startup companies. Um, we have universities. We have um, I'm in the process of working with Google on an opportunity. So those are some options. All right. Uh, um, Jeffrey, you have a question? Hey, Jeremiah, what are your uh, business models look like? Are, are, are these monthly subscriptions? Are these like consulting per hour? Um, and then how many customers do you have total? The business model, <clears throat> It's more of a monthly retainer cost. And so we provide, um, based on, on an intake with the prospective client, we provide them with a proposal and we have, as, as I said, these three tiers. Now we have a like a standard price tag to that, but if they want more, we obviously can add on to that. And then we'll, we'll usually go with a monthly retainer, though we can put a fixed price with milestones built in. And sorry, remind me the second question again. How many total customers and i'll throw in a, a third one um what's the sales cycle timeline look like um how many customers um well as i said we have uh, about seven um companies that we're working with so that would be seven revenue streams um generally speaking but for example usc which i work with we work with three different schools on the campus so we'll work with business, we'll work with engineering, communications, et cetera. Um, and then once we land a lead, it usually is within 30 days that we close that lead. Thank you, Jeremiah. Yep. All right, thank you so much. Uh, if there will be any investors interested to connect with you, the guys will let me know. Uh, and we're moving on to the next one, uh, founder. Uh, so uh, please stay in the, uh, stay here with us till the end if you can and support other founders. That would be great. Uh, uh, this is how it should happen between founders uh, supporting each other. Now, the next person, the next founder is Jake Ryder. Jake, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, you got two minutes. Go for it. Thank you. Um, we are a sexual wellness brand, a consumer sexual wellness brand based in Brooklyn um, called Good Parts. We exist to bridge the gap between our sex lives and our personal care lives. Um, in our opinion, sexual wellness has finally entered the mainstream, but most of the brands that have um, taken off and seen success are targeted towards women, and the ones that are targeted towards men remain in the realm of cringe, we have noticed. 
We can see female sexual wellness brands in beautiful packaging, sleek, discreet in mainstream retailers, but men's brands are generally, um, to name a few, gun oil, boy butter, Swiss Navy, often find, found behind a plastic lock and key at Walgreens. Um, not exactly the forefront of the um, 21st century of the gay experience. So Good Parts was born to reimagine the world of men's grooming, personal, sexual care, um, with the latter being at the center of it all. We launched about 18 months ago with two SKUs of lube as our flagship products. We have a silicone base and a water-based lube. Um, we have gotten about 4,000 customers to date about a quarter of which have repurchased and become regular customers so far. And we are also selling our products in places like the Standard Hotels, the Gathering in Miami, among others, Urban Outfitters, a few others as well. Um, gotten rave reviews from Press, GQ, Cosmo, Paper, um, and lots of five-star reviews. So we're seeing the, both the products, the packaging, and the brand approach differentiate from the current offering on the market. Um, we're looking to raise a seed round now to expand our product offering into new um new new SKUs and new areas we have two already in the works coming out this year including a self-pleasure lotion and a travel size and um we hope to expand further and to include things like condoms toys wipes face masks deodorant fiber just to name a few all right thank you so much jake and uh, we're moving on to questions yes sharks do you have questions jake, oh, yeah. how much oh. hey good uh um, jake how much today sorry one more time how much have you raised today you said you're raising for a seed but how much have you raised today uh 200k friends and family perfect and that was about two years ago and what's your attraction um we are primarily selling on d2c and um we haven't done much marketing and we make a pretty steady amount of revenue and customers per month um so looking to scale that um but current revenue is around uh i think 70k a year right now okay awesome are you putting people on a subscription in terms of like you know things like better you know like lube and and like um, wipes and things like that or are you um only doing it as a per per purchase element we have it available as a subscription. The vast majority are buying one off. I think it's hard to time those things with the products that we're offering right now. But in the future, definitely want to expand in subscriptions. All right. Grace, your turn. Um, do you, I mean, limited, limited marketing, can you talk to us about like how do you acquire customers, your CAC? Um, yeah. uh, and then, um, uh, yeah, let's start there, please. Yeah. Our strategy to date has been all, I mean, kind of organic traction and um, getting customers through a mix of word of mouth and sending out products to lots of different styles of influencers um, across Twitter and Instagram. Um, we have a bunch of merch products that have kind of taken off also that include kind of like these tall white socks, new hat, things like that have been helping get the word out too. Um, so to date, everything's been very word of mouth. We've done some events, we've done a few things here and there, but we're really looking to scale up marketing as a part of this um, next phase of growth also. Have you done any testing at all to figure out what that would be, or is it you yet don't? That's what you're going to test with this race. We've done a bit of testing already. Um, we definitely want to scale up um, working with paid influencers, considering the free ones that we worked with have been successful. Um, so we've actually identified a few already that we're going to be doing some tests with this summer, and we have a bit of paid acquisition that we're doing as well, um, that we hope to, you know, keep as a small portion of our, of our spend in the future, but hoping to really scale up on things that are going to reach a lot of people in the niche spaces of, um, mostly gay, um, internet culture. Jeffrey. Hey, Jake. Uh, thanks for sharing this morning. Um, just a quick question regarding uh, your lubrication product. Are you doing that fulfillment yourself or are you working through a third party? Um, so we uh, source the product through a factory that is in the US. There's actually um, only very, there's very limited options of um, American-based lube manufacturers. There's only one, it is in Nevada. The other ones, the competitors are importing it from mostly India. 
So um, we are sourcing that from that factory and then packaging it um, uh, using kind of things that we're putting, uh, assembling together. So totally. Um, awesome. Um, and and how long have you had that relationship? It, you know, from my understanding, bottling fees can really crush profit margins. Um, so are, are you working on a contract to try to reduce your bottling fees or fulfillment fees? We have very healthy margins at the moment. Um, so we've had some fluctuations over the past few years, but we've never gone into the threshold of a 20% um, COGS on, on all things included, including shipping, bottling fees, et cetera. So uh, we, have, we have some wiggle room there. And last question, um, do you have any regulatory bodies that you have to navigate either for your lubrication product or some of the upcoming products that you're looking to launch? Yes, we already have the certifications for the ones that we have live and the rest of them, we're familiar with the process at this point. All right, are there any investors in or out? Okay, thank you so much. For okay, was it? Yeah. What was the question? I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, yeah, totally, Jake. Uh, I think you're doing some cool work um, and it's Pride Month, so um, let's get together. Sounds okay. great. Fantastic. We have two sharks in. Congratulations. And uh, uh, we're going to connect you after the events uh, today or tomorrow. Fantastic. So still stay till the end and uh, support other founders, of course. So yes. well, the next person to present is Duncan Campbell. Uh, Duncan, are you ready? I'm ready. Yes. Okay. You got two minutes. Go for it. Great. Uh, thanks very much for this opportunity during Pride Month. This is great. Uh, my name is Duncan. I'm the founder of Rally which is a brand new social network for the LGBTQ community focused on sports and fitness. I think sports is an incredible force and it's got so much to offer to our community, especially physical and mental health benefits, the sense of community you get from team sports and this sense of inclusion, which I think a lot of us might not have experienced in our lives when it comes to sports. So over the last 18 months, I've been building a new social network. It's a mobile app and it's designed to let you create a profile, say which sports you're into, and find other people in your local neighborhood who are into the same sport, local teams, local events. You can suggest plans of things to do, and you can get out and you can play sports. Over the last 12 months since it was launched for iOS, uh, it's got about a 1,000 organic users. I haven't really been pushing for user acquisition, really. And about 200 teams across the world have signed up to create profiles, and they support the cause. I really want to take Rally to the next level, which is why I'm doing a pre-seed round now, looking for 500K USD. And that's to build a bunch of new features, make sure I find product market fit, build an Android app, which is really important for cross-platform, and then look for 250,000 users over the next 18 months. That's the goal. I think Rally has some really important monetization options. I think one of these is going to be corporate sponsorship. I think brands are looking for a really good ways to be visible on healthy platforms for our community. I also think there's a, an option for user subscriptions and even SaaS tools for teams to manage their users, uh, their members, sorry, and, uh, and their events. Uh, and I'm a solo founder. I've been running a mobile app studio for the last eight years. Uh, I think I've got the tools for the job and I think I can really take this to the next level and make it an international platform. Exciting to have you, Duncan. Uh, let's move to the questions. Dear Sharks, thank you for the questions. Thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, I'll take the first question. Uh, I was wondering, because in I've seen quite a lot of similar apps over the past years, I would say. How are you really different from the competition, or what is your main motivation for us setting up the rally that it is the way it is right now? Sure. So uh, I don't know of any specific sports app that's currently exists for the LGBTQ community. I think there's a few out which are looking to bring the community together. Uh, we've got Lex, which is quite big in the States at the moment, and, uh, and we've got Hornet Spaces. Um, the, thing, the difference here, I think, is that sports is a, a force which really brings us together and it is actually really good for our community because what it's doing is it's saying you can make friends with anyone from the community. It doesn't matter what age they are or what background they've got. Sports actually brings you together and it's away from the nightlife scene. It's away from different ways that we normally connect and we normally make friends. So I actually think this has got a unique perspective and, and it's the I think it's the first to market sports app for LGBTQ as far as I believe. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there more questions from the Sharks? 
I'll pop in here. Uh, love all things sports. So this is fun, neat, interesting. Um, you know, it talks about you're trying to go global um, and you have 200 teams. Uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, whenever you hear about somebody doing a, a launch, a global launch with that kind of dollar value raise, I get, um, I have recommendations otherwise, but uh, help me understand maybe a more micro launch uh, and how you plan to build community because, I mean, I think the aspect that gets us moving is a local community. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I fully agree. So actually what happened is, is when I launched the app, I was going to just launch it in the UK and focus there. But I had a lot of people from uh, outside of the UK asking for the app. And then once it was out internationally, we had teams just popping up, finding it. They wanted their profiles on there. I'm actually focusing all my energy on the UK at the moment. I think it's got a really active sports scene. So what I'm doing is I'm meeting up with teams, talking with them, getting them signed up, getting them to bring their users on board, focusing on trying to get individual cities working rather than focusing on just getting as many users across the globe as I can. What I want to do is make sure that a, an individual city is working well. We're seeing that in Edinburgh. There's quite a few sports teams there that are using the app exclusively. They're begging me for an Android app so that they can get all of their members on using the app at the same time. And so what we're seeing is in Edinburgh specifically, we're getting people joining the app because of that, making friends, starting to make plans, I'm starting to see things moving there. So the plan is with this 500K pre-seed round is to focus on the UK, focus on a few cities individually, make sure that they're working nicely once that looks like they're happening, start expanding it uh, across Europe and, and then into the States. Thank you. Duncan. Duncan, you just mentioned partnerships. Um, what do those partnerships look like? And also you mentioned features, like are they the ones that are asking for those specific features and what are those? Yeah, so in terms of partnerships, it, it's I still think I'm a bit, a bit too far away from actually approaching some of these brands and talking about what the partnerships can look like. But certainly we've seen things on Strava, like we've seen brands coming on and supporting individual events. They might be events which don't have a physical presence but have an online presence. There could be in the Nextdoor app, for instance, we see that brands can actually sponsor individual cities or individual sports, things, something like along those lines could be quite good. And I'm looking forward to once this is a bit more developed, actually going to these brands and talking to them about what ideas they might have as well for, for, um, for that. What was the other question? Can you remind me? Uh, features. Uh, you made it, you mentioned features earlier, and I was just wondering if these partnerships were asking for specific features and what those were. Sure. So the, mostly the teams that are coming on are asking for the features at the moment. They're saying that what they want is they want to move everything over and start using Rally exclusively. The problem we've got is that a lot of these sports teams don't really have any one platform or one infrastructure they can use. Some of them are on Meetup, some of them are on different platforms. They're all over the place. So actually to have team features where they can manage their members, manage their events, take payments for their memberships, take payments for their pitch hires. If I can get those services to them, what we can do is we can leverage their membership base. They'll bring their membership base to the app and then the app will start to fill up with people and that should create this effect where things get bigger. I was actually just about to ask, um, are you allowing um, the, the individual sports teams to actually also have um, like an e-commerce store attached to their, their team as well? Absolutely, that's something that I would love to do for them in the future. Uh, right now, the focus is to get basic features in so that they can do the things they need to do, and then and then we can take it from there. I definitely want to make this a, a platform where the teams are enabled to do as much as they can because they're the ones who are going to be bringing in the organic users. All right, thank you, Jeffrey. Hey, Duncan. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing your time today. Um, talk to me about your founding team. Uh, who's worked on a consumer uh, mobile application before? Right. So the, the I'm a solo founder. So I, at the moment, I've done everything myself. I've got a tech background. I'm a programmer. So I programmed the app myself, kind of started it during the pandemic, but really picked it up uh, 18 months ago and got it finished. Uh, I've worked with a bunch of different startups. I did the original app for LV, which is now a uh, a huge app and there's a, a bunch of different startups that I've worked with um, but at the moment it's just me on the team. What, who's helping you with customer acquisition and, and what's your uh, cat cost? 
Right. The customer acquisition, I, I've I've done everything on a very low budget at the moment. I haven't really spent anything on, on customer acquisition. Uh, everything's been done through social media, organic, word of mouth, me going to meet teams, play sports with them. I've kind of made it my mission to play every sport under the sun with a different team around the world so that I'm just going out meeting people. So at the moment, I don't have a customer acquisition cost. Uh, I'm looking forward to having some budget to get really stuck into that stuff. Last question. How many users do you have total? Yeah, it's about 1,200 at the moment. All how, many month, how many months has it been launched? Uh, about uh, 14 months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any, any investors in or out? I'm in. All right. Congratulations. One shark is in, two sharks is in, three sharks is in, four sharks. Almost jackpot. <laughs> Marika, are you in? Chris? <laughs> All right, congratulations. Four sharks are in and uh, we're moving on. So please stay, uh, stay till the end of, uh, of the program and support others. And uh, also, please, uh, everyone, especially startups, create your uh, profiles on the platform so you can connect with these investors and other investors. Uh, uh, I was posting a few times the link. So this is important. You have your profile and you can continue connecting. The next person is Guillermo Carotti. Guillermo, are you ready? Yeah, I am. All right, you got two minutes. Go for it. Cool. Thank you. So I'm back uh, from last week because, well, I'm gay. So <laughs> um, I am, I'm just going to tell you guys a bit about, my, about myself. So um, I, I, I come from a family of engineers. I built my own automated boat when I was 13, uh, just because I wanted it to be on the swimming pool. After that, um, I self-financed my trip to the UK. I went when I was 17 just to learn English. Um, when I went back to Brazil, I created my own website. Uh, where I would uh, import items from China and sell it to Brazilians three times the price I paid. Then I joined Wish, um, and I grew the Wish local program from 10 to 10,000 locations in Brazil. And then I helped them grow all of the other countries in the, in the Americas, US, Canada, and you know everyone else. Um, after that, um, while working, I just saw the opportunity to create Piki, my startup now. Um, so what we do is we bundle up e-commerce orders and send them to pick up locations, saving 30 to 40 percent of last mile shipping costs. Um, we, we do that and we save last mile shipping costs. And at the same time, we bring more customers to local businesses. Um, we charge 10 percent on the e-commerce side for the shipping uh, share. And then that's how we make money um, for now. Um, but it's a very, very early stage startup. Um, I went to Miami three weeks ago and I spoke to um, local businesses. I got LOIs from five local businesses in three days. I also am speaking with some investors um, and I got invited to apply to Miracle Plus from at YC China. I applied um, and I'm also in startup. Um, I, I applied to the cohort and I'm waiting for it as well. Um, and um, for now, um, we are basically, you know, trying to grow as much as we can, and um, we are we are just um, seeking fundraising to help us, um, you know, uh, kind of launch our thing, our startup. And at the same time, um, the cool thing that happened, you know, last week that when I was talking to one of the investors here, um, they told me that I'll be the next Airbnb for packages, which is super cool. And um, I'm very excited to be back, and um, you know, would love to connect with an, anyone that could help. Sounds fantastic. Dear Sharks, your questions. Yeah, I'd like to hear about your go to market strategy for onboarding. So the packages are going to like local businesses for pickup, correct? Yeah, so this is what happens. Um, instead of you sending 10 packages to 10, 10 different locations, you know, like homes, for example, um, you bundle up those packages and send them to one location which is a local business and that brings more food traffic for those local businesses and also saves on last mile shipping costs great and so how are you onboarding these businesses that people are picking up from i am going i'm going in person and talking to local businesses myself we have you know i have people helping with logistics i just I got another advisor to help me with the fundraising process and everything, but I'm going myself because I love to hear from my customers. You have one thing that I need to, that you need to understand is that you need to give something before getting something. So I imagine me with a hundred thousand locations. I can get you know logistic systems uh, implemented, payment systems implemented, a bunch of things. I wanted to be and when I said this, I said to one of the sharks, I said, you know, I want to be the next Uber for packages. 
packages. And he said, I think you're going to be the next Airbnb for packages. So that was really express, you know, really exciting to hear. Um, so yeah, um, we are we are just in our very early stages, and um, we hope to grow as much as we can, and um, you know, dominate the market. And how many users do you have currently, and how many businesses have you onboarded? For now, five, and then I'm going to tell you a reason why. Um, I did grow Brazil to ten thousand locations in at Wish, and um, they had a year with me you know, managing them and they did not receive anything. I do not want my new um, locations for my startup to have a bad experience like they have, hey, they had. I'm going to be very, you know, I'm very customer focused. I want them to have the best experience they can have. How many packages have you, have you done for those five companies to date? And uh, what sort of revenue are you getting from that? We haven't uh, launched, launched yet. We are planning to launch in, um, during the holiday season, that's when we get we get more money. Um, but we we have well, this is well. I, one of my advisors told me that StockX wants to talk to us, but at the same time, I want to make sure that all of my logistics are working perfectly. I do not want to burn my bridges, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So I think it's safe to say, I just want to clarify. So it's safe to say that you are pre-money, pre-revenue, you're super early. Um, have you thought out, thought about raising a friend's family round? And if you have, how much have people been willing to um, give you? Um, are you bootstrapping? Have you looked at um, crowdfunding? Have you looked at other sources of raising capital? So yeah, now we're going to look into angel, uh, angel investors. We, well, actually, I'm talking to some VCs as well. Um, I spoke to New York um, Ventures uh, uh, this week, actually, and they said they're going to get back to me next week. Um, they work with, um, you know, they've, they've got like investors like Amazon, eBay, and those are, would be people that would definitely work with me. Um, and actually, when I went to Miami, um, I got one hub that used to be an Amazon hub. And they told me they decided to quit because Amazon was not delivering them the customer that they wanted. And I'm like, hmm, yeah, I'm actually doing a, you know, something different because I'm actually sending you customers that you want. Um, and then they decided to join us. All right, Jeffrey. Your microphone. My question was regarding your LOIs. Um, what's the potential revenue uh, per per each LOI? So those LOIs are local businesses. So, for example, they are not. Um, I do not get money from them at the moment. Um, they are receiving food traffic from being a pickup location for us. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, your sharks are there any sharks in or out? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, if there would be any shark interested, we will connect you. Please stay till the end. Uh, make sure that you have a profile on our platform. And uh, uh, we're moving on to the next person, which is um, which is Christopher Faraguna. Christopher, Chris, are you ready? Yeah, hello. Hey, everybody, how are you doing? Yeah, doing well. Uh, you got two minutes. Okay, great, great. Yeah, my name is Chris Faraguna. I own a company called WinQuest. WinQuest is an augmented reality treasure hunting app, and it also has other games of skill, chance to win contests in it, and uh, just a free chance to win raffles and scratch offs in it. But basically, uh, this app and platform took several years to build, and we're going to be live in the Google Play Store at 177 nations by, it looks like, by next week. And so it's been a long project, big project. Um, the augmented reality gaming market is a big sector, a hot sector. Uh, Grandview Research thinks that the um, the augmented reality gaming sector is going to be two hundred and seventy four billion dollar market by two thousand twenty seven. If you check on uh, Agent GPT, OpenAI, and you ask what's the best uh, idea for an augmented reality game, it comes up with my app. Um, we also have intellectual property patents in to use AI with AR with this application to then have a uh, augmented reality platform to uh, promote augmented reality uh, advertisements 
And uh, so we, we got the novelty for that globally. So um, we're excited. So yeah, so we're looking for about a half a million. Uh, this is pre-seed, more like MVP. We built it and uh, we're ready to launch. Sounds great. Yeah, Sharks, your questions. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about your background and, you know, um, is it in game development or marketing or? Yeah, it was in marketing and marketing and sales. Uh, it was in marketing and sales for over over 10 years in the residential construction industry. And uh, when I saw how valuable data is and, you know, these augmented, you know, these gaming platforms, I focused my, my efforts on making an app that is uh, a game, fun game in the in the front front end, but it, it accumulates data, and that data can be sold. It's very valuable. So, who on your team is building the actual technology? Well, I have two senior IT uh, technicians that have been working for, uh, for me for over two years, but I had set, uh, fourteen technicians before that that took it two and a half years to build the app with the blueprints. So this has been a massive undertaking and uh, to get to this point. Great. How much money did it take? Did you self-invest or did you raise capital for this? Yeah, I, I raised uh, about 275. I put in close to 600,000 into it, building it myself, bootstrapped it. And is this your only product or like, do you have another game like in the development? I mean, you know, I'm just trying to understand pipeline, if you would. No, this is, uh, this is, this is the MVP. This is the game. I don't have other games uh, in the pipeline. I could integrate Web3, you know, other applications uh, in, into the, into the game. We have an AR basketball game we're going to put in there. We're looking to, in the future, uh, make like a gladiator, gladiator show event where it's several different things. It could be trivia, an AR basketball contest. Whoever gets the most points would win that contest. So it's, it's kind of like a reality show for AR, but with games. So we are thinking about integrating other games. But in the beginning, we we you know we have a huge opportunity with just the uh, the augmented reality treasure hunting, you know, app. Thank you. Are there more questions? Uh, yeah, Crystal. Yeah, that was uh, Christopher. Um, I love this because I love treasure hunting and I love honestly one of my hobbies is shark to hunt hunting. So maybe add something like that in there. Um, very cool idea. I love it. Um, as far as exit strategy goes, what is your plan for that? Well, because we have patents in before AI became a big buzz about two and a half years ago, I put in patents to use AI to, to work together with the the data like a modern day switchboard with AI, AI algorithms to then be able to have an augmented reality digital AI platform. <clears throat> um, because I got the novelty for that and you know the whole game and everything else, we got the patents and novelty for it. We, we believe that uh, you know Google, Facebook, or Apple would be interested in our patents and or the platform that we built. We've already had an inroad with you know one of the big guys and they said after it's you know launched they want to come and take a look at it. They gave uh, the merger and acquisition number because this is a new way to get data. It's not uh, with the third party apps and spying. It's more people voluntarily giving their data to get points. Those points can get then be used on games of skill contests to win, you know, bigger prizes. So they don't have to pay for entry for some of these premium treasure hunts, you know, globally and these other premium games of skill contests. How many patents are we talking about? I have two patents, but the one that's the most valuable is the one that has the AI with the AR and, you know, augmented reality billboards that match the data profile. And then, you know, yeah, so that, that's the more valuable patent. All right. Thanks. Jeffrey. Hey, Christopher. Uh, talk to me about uh, maybe languages. Are you using Unity, Unreal? Uh, and what's your engineering team look like? Oh, uh, the AR core. Um, uh, we're also, uh, Python, I can send you the tech stack and everything to, to over to you. And you can talk to our engineers and any questions you have in the future, any future discussion. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe my next question would be, um, who who's in charge of your animation? Uh, well, again, 
where we, we, I have a, uh, a graphics artist that's working with us for the animation and making augmented reality images, you know, 2D into 3D to bring them into our uh, game. I have an employee right now, but um, there was, there's a huge opportunity. You brought this up for HQ VFX applications, which you, where VFX would be integrated with AR to permit, you know, present, you know, animation and really high-end commercials to the end user's phone. So that's a real big opportunity. What do you think the average deal size would be for each of the each of these um, camp campaigns or, or, or um, cash hunts that you were going to be running? Uh, it's difficult to say because, uh, you know, what I did was, it's not like for the individual's phone, this, this is a whole city can be involved in an event. So because it's a game of skill, we could charge $5 to $60 for a contest, depending on what the prize could be. That could be, a, you know, yeah, between 5,000 to 50,000 people or even more that would join the contest. So we would make all that, uh, you know, premium treasure hunt entry fees. And then there's in-app purchases uh, that we have, you know, trivia points. If you get them wrong, it's an in-app purchase. And then the big money is the data on the back end. Right. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. So, I was just going to ask in terms of your revenue structure or the revenue pricing and model, have you actually worked, uh, have you started like testing that to see what the customers are actually wanting or have you mm -hmm. uh, sort of like locking them into sort of like just a, a pay for all the access there? Uh, well, no, the way, the way that we structured it is we have the freemium model right? So that everybody can get involved and they give us a little bit of information each. And if we get the, the you know, the, quite the uh, trivia questions wrong in between stops, they need to, you know, have an in-app purchase so that to wait six to eight minutes, depending on what we set the time to. So uh, as far as uh, the, the desire for the chance to win and or augmented reality games, it's high. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question correctly. If you have anything else you want to know about it. I was just more, I guess, I'm trying to understand, you know, like what the feedback has been from people to understand, like, you know, what sort of okay. cost them, and things like that in terms of building a relationship with them long term. We, we interviewed like over 120 people on the streets and asked them, would they download this app either for the augmented reality treasure hunt or for the Groupon aspect where we get, you know, data and then we try to find you coupons, you know, for, to get you in-app exclusive coupons. Would you download this app for you know for either one of those things? And out of 120 people, not one person said no. So you know if they weren't younger and they were interested in the treasure hunts, they were older. They were more interested in the Groupon aspect of us, you know, matching their data profile with merchant affiliate coupons. All right. Are there more questions? Okay. Are there any sharks in or out? I'm in. All right, congratulations. One shark is in. Fantastic. We will connect you right, right after the event. Any connections happening here, we will connect you via email afterwards. Uh, so everyone who had connections and also on the platform Google World. All right. So uh, uh, great job, Chris. And uh, we're moving on uh, to the next uh, founder, uh, which is Brittany. Uh, uh, so Brittany, you ready? Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Brittany, founder of Sadu. So Saudi is a lending platform for low carbon project finance. This um, essentially companies will buy carbon credits so they can reach emissions reductions requirements either due to regulation or by pressure from specific customers. So these carbon credits are usually purchased um, after internal operations are kind of switched around in order to have companies reduce their emissions. Um, this means that the carbon market itself is going super fast. It generated $84 billion in revenue, um, according to the World Bank, in 2022 alone. Uh, but anyone who has been following the carbon market or climate tech at all knows that it's under a tremendous amount of criticism, especially with the leading issuers of carbon credits being claimed to have sold over $200 million of credits that honestly haven't done anything. Um, but even with all of this, let's say, headwind or criticism, you still have regulatory pressure for companies to report and reduce their emissions. You have climate-related financial risk that has been proven. And then for those of us who care about the planet, the overall need for carbon removal in the first place. 
Um, so given all of these factors, the market really should be growing a lot faster. But what's actually holding it back is just a lack of transparency. And it's not necessarily a lack of transparency around what's happening the, on the ground, i.e. is this carbon being removed or um, on the side of the companies, but rather the brokers and the intermediaries in the middle. These are the ones who are selling the carbon credits from a project and then uh, transferring it to a company. So the solution is really just to increase transparency by evaluating the integrity of these marketplaces, giving them the ability to build trust more quickly and fund new projects, new um, project finance, the <laughs> new carbon removal projects. So Sadhu does this um, by combining first and third party data into an algorithm that evaluates the integrity of these carbon credit marketplaces. We then use this information on a lending platform that gives them the ability to finance new carbon removal projects. The business model is a SaaS plus, so it's an annual subscription for access to the ratings and research generated by the algorithm. Um, and then later we will integrate transaction fees on the funding that is then raised through the platform. So we're about pre-product and already have 19 marketplaces that are committed to our benchmarking program and really did a lot of research. We did about 80 interviews in two months uh, with everyone from carbon credit marketplaces to consultants, to CFOs, heads of sustainability to validate like the genuine need for transparency and need for funding uh, these new projects. So on the team, uh, I spent the past decade in climate, uh, both on the policy side and then as an investor, I then built a direct to consumer health and fitness app that rewarded users with digital carbon credits um, and our lead engineer previously worked at a global credit ratings ish, um, agency within Morningstar and has over five years experience as a full stack developer. So our ask, we just completed the last cohort of Entrepreneurs Roundtable Accelerator in New York, and we're raising 750 pre-seed. Thank Thanks. You. All right, dear Sharks, your questions. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm quite interested in this. Um, I'm just curious around, um, are you also going to be capturing, um, you know, ESG um, data as well so that people can start reporting on that through the app as well? Yeah, so a lot of companies, if we just take Europe, for instance, and the US is close behind, we have about 50,000 companies through the CSRD that are report, required to report on their emissions. So this is a lot of the times data that companies are already gathering or going to other sources to make sure that they have. With our platform, they can essentially leverage this data to then issue project finance or bonds for project finance. Um, so it's taking information they already have and letting them turn it into working capital. No question. So I, I was a big a partner at a big energy fund in the uh, New York back in the day, and this is also very interesting. Um, Talk about where you really are like, great, I'm interested, Ben's interested, like this is interesting. Um, where really are you like pre product? That means a lot of things like help me really understand where you're. I'm saying this lovingly and kindly because I want to yeah. figure out how to help you. I just kind of don't really like that was your pitch. That was great. But like help give us a snapshot. Um, and so that, that'd be really helpful for me. Yeah. So we're expecting to have our prototype out in September of this year. So just a couple months. Um, and our first LOI for funding to be raised on the platform by the end of this month. And this is in addition to these 19 marketplaces that have committed to sharing data on how they're collecting emissions reporting, just committed to sharing data to building out that first data pipeline where we can essentially verify the emissions reductions. Um, yeah, that's where we are. And then that first deal that you're raising, like, let's talk about like what you think the value is, who's in it. I mean, part of this is the marketplace. So how do you help me understand that, please? Yeah. So the way that we're building out this platform is one by first sharing the data that is collected through these carbon credit marketplaces. Uh, so we're looking at things like who are they using to audit their carbon credits? Who are they using to like what satellite providers are they using to verify that this work is being done? Under what conditions are they selling carbon credits? Is it a 50% split between them and the project developer? This is a type of information that we are going to release to um, these 19 marketplaces or potentially corporates who are in the early access program. So that will help us build the pipeline of like essentially issuers onto the platform. 
Um, and then meanwhile, the business development and pushing out different content related marketing and research is where we would then go out and recruit, let's say, potential investors or the lenders that would then be interested in the projects. All right, uh, Jeffrey. Your microphone. This microphone keeps getting me, everybody. Uh, Brittany, thanks for uh, sharing your day with us. Um, maybe you can uh, talk to me about how long it, it took you to, to for the sales cycle for that first LOI and how long you project your further LOIs to take. Yeah, this is a good question. We definitely need more data on this. So this first customer um, is a actual uh, one of the advisors for Sadu. So it's... Um, yeah, I guess like our advisor is a CFO at Terraformation. So they're one of these product developers slash marketplaces. Um, and they really help us dive deep into what their biggest barriers to actually getting funding are. So we've been working closely with them to build out a solution that would help them. Um, on top of that, I also have an advisor at Moody's who's the head of ESG, and he's focused more on the uh, corporate side on, on what their requirements are. Um, so through that is where we can get a better perspective on how long the sales pipeline would take. Um, but obviously, we're aiming for no more than six to eight months, which is more or less the industry standard. So that's a smart move. Um, now I'm going to pivot and ask a question. If you were to get 750 grand today, uh, where would it go um, and how would you allocate it? Yes. Yeah, so engineering, <laughs> 100 um, percent. And then to be able to essentially get out our prototype faster. Um, we and there are currently two devs, two additional developers that I would love to recruit and have come on board full time. Um, but if we're able within these next 18 months, myself and my co-founder and potentially a couple of others who can help on a consulting basis, come on board, get the prototype out and get at least 20 um, paying customers on board, that would be the specific goals or action steps I would take. Thanks, Brittany. And uh, shameless pitch for Chris, uh, you should totally check out a start out and their uh, founder network. I think it apples to apples fits where you're at and I'll let Chris and start out, take it from there with you. Okay. Hey, awesome. Thanks. One, one quick question I have uh, to follow on um, is around, um, you know, you mentioned uh, that it's really great for fundraising and um, for projects. Are you also allowing the, um, you could, around the transparency element for the uh, investors to see like budgets and things like that and how people are tracking against budgets for the allocated amount that they raised against? for that project? Yeah, that's something we're definitely testing for. Um, we want to be able to understand like what level of data is needed and what these companies are willing to share. Um, but essentially for the MVP, we're looking at just the repayment history uh, for the actual debt that's issued on the platform. And then any other, let's say, forms of projects finance that are actually linked to this like low carbon um, project itself. So that's where I we're starting. I, yeah, no, that that's great. And I guess on the other side of that, like you know, actually helping the um, you know, the people who are doing the project actually budget for how much they need to raise for those projects as well. I think it would be quite handy as well. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thank you so much. We're moving on. We have nine more hands to uh, pitch. And uh, uh, are there any sharks in or out? Um, I'm definitely in. All right. Yeah. Four sharks are in. Congratulations. Uh, it's almost jackpot. And uh, uh, maybe mov moving on. Thank you, Brittany. Stay till the end if you can, uh, supporting others. And the next person to present is Rosario Picone. Rosario, are you here? Yes. Yes. That's two minutes. Go for it. Perfect. So oh, it was February of 2019. My best friend and I were downtown Chicago and it was freezing cold. As part of a high school trip, we had to come back to Aurora, which is a suburb about 45 minutes away on a, one of those terrible yellow school buses. It was cold, bumpy, and just all around miserable. We had some awful neck pillows. Oh, it's not showing up in the thing. We had some awful neck pillows, um, but they were too small to get the job done. And we couldn't bring the, the nice pillows we had on our bed. So we figured, well, what can we do about this? We went back to our dorm room, broke out the sewing machine, and we came out with the siesta wrap, which is an upshade pillow with a blanket that pulls right out of the back. And I'm having a little bit of issue with the uh, background here. But um, anyway, uh, we started selling, it was started prototyping in 2019, and we uh, just are hitting the market now. Um, Beyond that, the home goods market is a $387 million serviceable attainable market for us. Travel accessories is very similar at 265 and sleep aids is at 144 million. 
Um, we sell two ways, B2B and B2C. Uh, B2B, a lot of businesses like to buy our products, to put their branding on it, and then they can sell it as merchandise, uh, just as they would uh, sweatshirts or beanies. Um, and then uh, B2C pipeline, we primarily uh, sell through our e-commerce platforms. So think Amazon or our websites. And we typically sell to Amer American mothers between the ages of 25 and 70 with a household annual income greater than $100,000. Um, and they like to buy the CS strap as a gift for either other people in their family or um, themselves as well. The CS strap is perfect to take on uh, trips and travel. It's great to use at home on the couch. It's fantastic to use at events, concerts in the park. And it's also great to use for camping in the summer. Um, we have a lot of intellectual property so far. Uh, we are fully pet the design is fully patented and we have protection in 74 countries overseas. Uh, we've raised $70,000 so far uh, just to handle the manufacturing in China. And uh, we're hopefully hoping to be profitable by the third year and by our fifth year and exit at third year. Your time, please wrap it up. Yes. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Sharks, your questions. I do. Thanks for that. Um, so you said you're B to B and B to C. Are do you have any partnerships uh, with retailers or local stores yet? Yes, we have a few small re uh, local retailers. Um, so a lot of home goods stores, and we've also gone to a number of pop ups, um, and uh, that's where we've gotten to interact with our our primary B to C customer as well. And what percentage mix of like your sales come from B to C versus B to B? I would say about 25% of our sales are B2B so far. Um, we haven't given it a whole lot of effort because we've been focusing on the marketing and ad spend on Facebook and Google. Um, so yes. And what's your customer acquisition costs? Uh, so we've just done a little bit of testing so far. Customer acquisition cost is probably around $100 so far, but I just want to just caveat on that. We've done very limited testing with advertising. Um, we just recently partnered with the advertising agency for Hug Sleep, which was a Shark Tank company, and they're going to be working on um, helping us along as well. And what is the retail value of the unit? Yeah, so we we retail for 54, and then we do a few, you know, think like 10 to 20% discount um, for uh, various deals. Okay. So then what's your target CAC if you're spending 100 per customer, but it only retails in the 50s? Yes, yes. So that that will definitely come down over time. Um, target CAC is at $10. Um, and that's very similar to, again, like I said, Hug Sleep, SandCloud, a lot of similar similar kind of consumer-based uh, consumer goods. Okay, great. Thank you. Any sharks in or out? I'm in. There was one shark in. Are there more questions? Okay, thank you so much. We're moving on to the next person. We have eight more hands. And uh, the next one is uh, Sachar Grimbeck uh, from this side. Sachar, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You got two <clears throat> of it. So, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hi, Sharks. My name is uh, Shachar Grimbeck, and I'm both a serial tech entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur. I was part of the initial team at Monday.com and also founded a startup. You know, called Rips AI, which helped big call centers like MS, AZ Jet Shell to increase in efficiency by 30%. I sold it two years ago. And on the social side, I founded an NGO called LGB Tech that promotes diversity inclusion in Israel. And now that I've told about, uh, a little bit about my background, let me tell you uh, the most exciting part, my new startup, Excite. Excite is here to reinvent the travel industry, we're turning boring, forgotten historical sites into dynamic living experiences. Using the power of AR and generative AI technologies, we give those sites a whole new life. We're essentially transforming visitors, visitors' smartphones into portals to the past, enabling, enabling visitors to explore history like never before. In today's digital age, historical and tourist sites, need to transform from the analog to the digital to remain relevant. Sites all around the world understand that in order to stay relevant for the digital generation, they need to transform from analog to, to digital. Uh, but the biggest barrier is the cost of building immersive experience. It costs $200,000 on average. A year-long project 
which is a mount which is a mountain too high to climb for most of the hundreds of thousands of sites worldwide that receive five billion visitors annually. Here's where Excite plays the game changer. We're building a B2B2C scalable platform that leverages generative AI and AR technologies to empower any site to generate its unique, authentic experience. So, Charlie, you pass time, please. We're the Wix of the tourist sites. Yeah. So, we're a license based pricing model. Uh, eliminates the massive upfront investments at 10% of the current market cost. In essence, Excite helps these sites achieve their ultimate goals, attract more visitors, achieve higher uh, visitor satisfaction. We launched a few months ago, and uh, we're closing a few uh, first customers, uh, some of which are a few thousands of, few dozens of thousands of dollars in a long pipeline of around 20 sites. We raised initial funding of $200,000 from angels, and a few successful entrepreneurs. And uh, we're in the process of receiving a grant of $400,000 from the Israel Innovation Authority for Deep Technologies as part of our SAFE. Thank you. We built a deep team of senior executives uh, uh, from AI and creative. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, everyone, please uh, uh, try to respect time so we have a lot of people to pitch and uh, so we can give everyone a chance to pitch. Thank you so much. And we're moving on. Uh, dear Sharks, your questions. Wants to start? Yeah, I'll jump in here. I've seen a lot of this actually advised to companies doing this. Like, what, um, how are you very localized market? Um, how are you different than kind of what's out in the marketplace on immersive experience? Um, if you would. Yeah, of course. So there is plenty of AR experiences for science, right? And there is, uh, most of them are building. Uh, those experiences with studios. The problem is that it costs a lot of money, $200,000 on average, and it's a long process of around a year long project. So with our platform, we're, we're taking <laughs> both all the, we're eliminating all the challenge of both the technology and we're providing them tools for building scalable content. Okay, we're taking, they can just provide their story and maybe a few uh, 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 designs or photos. And we're taking all this media and generating 3D content with generative AI. So we're in a very good position, uh, very good timing, I would say, uh, that the generative AI revolution is here. So with this power of generative AI, we can build short, which I mean, let's say four weeks, and with only 10% of the cost of any other uh, studio in the market, we can gener generate the, we can generate sorry that content, which makes it very scalable. All right, thank you. Are there more questions from the sharks? Are you going to look at advertising um, as a potential revenue stream for um, from like bars and restaurants and things like that that are in the areas of the site, so that you can like push people to those places and things like that? Is that what you're sort of thinking about a whole? Um, so sort of like structure around that? So, uh, I, I mean, we believe that advertising uh, revenues are a bit low. So those sites would uh, be happy to pay license of let's say ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 per year. And with an option to uh, increase the revenues of having like premium content for the visitors, uh, like a premium that some of the visitors can pay extra like $5 or $10, and then both we can generate more revenues and also the site can generate more revenues. Thank you very much. Are there any sharks in or out? Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Please stay, stay till the end. Uh, make sure to have, to, to have your profile on our platform and support others. We're moving on and the next person is, uh, 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 sorry if I pronounce my, the name incorrectly, Gans, Gansham Singh Sekhwat. Sekhwat. Gansham, you ready? No problem, Daniel. I'm ready. Uh, this is Gansham. You pronounce it correctly. Hi, everyone. This is Gansham Singh. Uh, I'm the founder of Lit Energy, and we are based out of India. And we are a platform uh, that is based for renters. So this is the first digital platform for renters to acquire renewable energy without any hardware installation. Yes, you heard me right. There is no on-site hardware installation. There is a digital way to uh, to get your renewable energy onto the platform. 
the way it works is as a residential buyer or as a small business owner you have a lot of uh, areas to input solar energy uh, may it be solar may it be wind but traditional people that are actually into the industry may have an oversight some people do not have the funds to build it some people do not have the access to roof space to build it and to our vision uh, once and policy to all we believe there is not a question that should be regarded as such so we built a platform for uh, so homeowners for residential buyers for small business owners to get access to renewable energy at the half the cost of traditional government electricity and that also on a very payable payment scheme so it works as you come onto the platform you upload your bill number or bill size and we get you availability on equal platforms available to you so you can pick your choose your own digital energy providers they will be generating credits those will be awarded into your wallets and with that you can play your uh, pay your digital bills uh, online our vision uh, towards the ecosystem is we can actually move forward into the Digi uh, digital energy eco ecosystem uh, starting from digital bills today and then to electric cars and the uh, vision beyond we have a traction of 2 megawatts from the local government supported and purchased that is a power purchase agreement in continuity and we still have a power commitment of 3.5 megawatt in consumer uh, buyers so we still are lacking energy need then we are lacking customer support we are partnered with the uh, Uh, leading uh, solar and wind businesses in our sectors, and those have committed around 10 megawatts of solar and wind projects by 2026. Uh, that's all from my side. Uh, I'd like to take some questions. Thank you. Right on time. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. Some questions. Is there any? Oh, Jeffrey, go first. The microphone. <laughs> I'll figure out how to use Zoom uh, this morning. <laughs> uh, could you talk to me a little bit about your founding team um, and what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. We are a founding member of three people, and well, two of them are traditionally into the product side. They have a heavy background in engineering and front end. Uh, myself, I have a background in uh, blockchain technology and also using energy and sustainable credits. For the last two years, we have been focusing on this industry. Uh, I have quit my job to focus on this fully, and other the team members are still working in their respective industry spaces of blockchain and front end jobs. As well. How much money have you raised so far, and have you talked to any like large-based funds that are in India right now? Absolutely. So what we have raised is all completely bootstrap till now. That is uh, amounting up to twenty k in dollars and up to twenty lakhs in Indian local currency. And what we have looked forward to from local fund bases, we have applied to uh, grants and uh, coming up fellowships from Google for Startups and Antler India, and we are try, uh, still trying to get few responses in before. End of this June. And and how much are you trying to raise? Uh, we are looking for a fund of not more than three fifty k in dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any sharks uh, in or out? Okay. Thank you so much. Please stay till the end, and uh, uh, we're moving on to the next uh, person. I, I'm I'm in. Are oh, you uh, in? Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. We have one. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, all right, congrats. Moving on, and uh, the next person is uh, um, Elena Lip Liplina. Liplina. Elena, go for it. Yeah, that's me. Hi, uh, dear sharks. Actually, it was quite encouraging for me to see your reaction to Duncan's uh, app with Rally because we're doing something similar but with a different twist. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect people with sports and healthy lifestyle and specifically LGBTIQ community, uh, women, persons with disabilities, but we're doing it quite differently. We're building a marketplace instead of social media because we understand that social media is actually a part of the problem why people can't find anything they're looking for right now. So we have tons of examples and tons of experience uh, you know, with uh, our research interviews and actually ourselves. Because if I ask you right now, if you wanted to play any sports that you currently play in a different country, which things you would use where would you go facebook instagram but this contains no useful information for you that would contain i mean if you find a team there would be no times for practices there would be no photos i mean if it's instagram there would be photos but no no pricing nothing so all you need and a similar problem existed in the, in the travel world prebooking.com all information was scattered around until booking came in and put it all together and did something to make it very, very feasible and possible for you to actually access, you know, accommodation. So we're doing just the same. We're putting in place a very particular um, 
framework of the marketplace instead of a social media and we're doing that for all things sports what that means actually is that it's not only teams but it's everything that concerns sports so it's it's merchandise it's uh, it's uh, it's coaches it's facilities anything you need we have quite a lot of traction and i understand we are running out of time right now but i'll welcome your questions uh, about the team because i have a lot lots to tell about that we have uh, in-depth experience in running um in running sports and organizing sports and i myself was a board member of the uh, european lgbt sports federation so we know exactly what we're building and we have quite attraction to achieve that so um yeah your questions dear sharks Thank you very much right on time dear sharks your questions Who wants to go first um i'll go first um love to hear more about uh that more specifically though um what are you how are you generating revenue what does that look like yeah i mean if you're building a marketplace revenue is not something you generate from from the start on we understand we're here for the long run and our long run doesn't mean that we are generating any revenue as of now because you need to bring massive traffic into the platform and you need to the platform to be with great user experience so this is what we're focused right now but uh we already raised eighty three thousand equity free money in grants from a german government foundation from startup chile and from adidas who believe in the idea and want us to develop that further um we also have two letters of intent from municipalities who are interested in us developing this platform to help uh, municipalities filling more facilities and bring more people into sports. So that's for us, you know, the proof of the product product market fit. And as I said, the you know the marketplace takes a while to bring any revenue in, but this is the reason why we're raising right now, and this is the, re the reason why we're here for the long run. And our team has a super marathon mentality. We know that we're not gonna earn as much start earning as much uh, we have an, one idea though it's uh, affiliate marketing because once we bring in lots of lots of people interested in sports we can market uh the apps for example because you know as, as an aggregator for sports apps this is uh something that we can do right now and we can start generating right now but at this moment we're focused on refining the uxui launching you know doing the proper launch and getting the first traffic into the platform I'm going to piggyback on that. So thank you for that. Um, you mentioned affiliate marketing. I would suggest looking at other ways in which you can create revenue, right? Because me as an investor, like I want to know that one, you are generating revenue and two, you're getting to a point at some, right? Whatever that point ends up being where you're either selling or you're getting, or you're acquiring other companies. Um, I want to know that I'm getting my money back. Um, so I would just, just take a look at, right? Other revenue streams. I know it's a marketplace and yes, you have to build the, customer base, but just keep that in mind from an yeah. investor standpoint. Absolutely. The model, uh, the model, the primary model that we have right now is subscription. It's just we're not actively selling right now. And this is this is uh, this is the main point I wanted to to emphasize. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the biggest things around uh, you know community based sport is actually building community and things like that and trying to get the community involved in a greater level. I'm curious how you're going to be able to do that. And not just being able to find a team and things like that, but actually look at that community aspect, which I know is a big, important thing around community sport. Yeah, that's an amazing question. And thank you for doing that. Actually, within our team, we're the community builders because we built something from scratch ourselves. I built a, a two division basketball championship for women from scratch. So I have an in-depth expertise in building communities per se. This is one of my like strongest traits. Uh, one of the things that we definitely plan right now, and this is in the works with Adidas, is, is a big event for women in the LGBTIQ uh, that will take place in France. And this is something Something that is dedicated to a specific audience and that is something that will highlight our role in bringing people into sports so we will use a lot of uh you know off offline marketing to promote the idea to bring people together to build communities and also our social media is going to emphasize this idea of community building of getting people into sports especially those underrepresented and under uh you know uh 
what 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 was I meant to say? But underrepresented in sports. Another thing is, as I said, I'm a former director, a board director of the European Gay and Lesbian Sports Federation, and EGLSF actually runs the the Euro Games, which is the biggest event for LGBTQs in sports. And I have lots of connections in that community, and this is a direct way for us to promote the marketplace and to promote the value uh, of the marketplace because it has uh, over five thousand members, and the events bring around uh 20,000 people every year so and i have direct access to this target audience all right thank you As, uh jeffrey you have a question yeah. hey lena have you reached out to the gay games and, and spoken to them at all sure sure i actually sat down with joni evans uh in valencia because they're bringing down the the games in valencia we haven't got to talk the specifics yet but she was very i mean the the board of the gay games were really interested and we also reached out to uh the the municipality of valencia because this is a great gateway for us to work together because they are i mean they're gonna bring sports to people uh in a particular way and this is uh this is the synergy that we see ourselves coming in quite sleekly so yes thank you for bringing that up uh, awesome uh super interested love to continue to chat and a shameless plug both for uh daniel at ggw and uh you know chris over at start out i think they, they both have done an amazing job building community um and they can prove it every day i, I think even on this call um, and I'd recommend you reach out to them, uh, if not just to just to have an informational chat on how you do that. Amazing, thank you. Thank you so much. Great, uh, uh, great point, and happy to talk to to you guys. Yeah, we support founders and investors. Uh, so I think uh, the final questions I have as any shark in or out. <laughs> I'm in. Okay, congrats. We have one shark in, so we will connect you right uh, so after the event today or tomorrow. So we're moving on. Please stay, stay till the end. Create a profile on our platform at Google World. And the, the next person to pitch is Sofia Con, Contre, Contreras. Sofia, you ready? Hi there, folks. Uh, my name is Sofia Stone. I'm the founder of Indie Tech. Uh, we are uh, private marketplaces for large financial institutions to manage their the performance of their suppliers. So a lot of folks know about the supply chain snarls, but most don't know that it's actually impacting financial institutions. I get a lot of banks have sub uh, have supply chains. Uh, they have very, very large procurement uh, offices. And within that, there is an area of risk called third party risk. That area is currently being compounded by regulatory pressure and the size of failures increasing to around a billion dollars. Uh, the current framework doesn't work. And so we've built a framework to help quantify third party risk. Uh, so you can think of us like the FICO of supplier performance, scoring suppliers as they deliver and creating um delivery histories and performance histories and continuously monitoring so that we can better manage uh the risk that banks take on when uh they're working with third-party suppliers uh we are post i mean we're post product uh just entering into the market and currently uh testing into financial institutions we're working on closing the first contracts uh, the top U.S. banks have asked us, we started by pitching pilots around $20 million of spend. One of the biggest U.S. financial institutions has declined that in favor of us taking on the entire consulting spend inclusive of payment rails, which has really uh, pushed our need to raise uh, so that we can manage the, the scale that's happening or that's going to be happening uh, within the next few years. We've developed partnerships at Microsoft. We have an elite team uh, that I'm happy to go into more depth around, uh, as well as an advisory team who are elites in the financial service industry. That's okay. a little bit about us. Last time, please wrap it up. Yep. No, that's a little bit about us. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Dear Sharks, your questions. Um, and you mentioned you've got some um, LOIs and things like that. I'm curious what those contracts, um, you know, like equate to to date, and then also where you see mm -hmm. some fruit. Is it at the larger um, banks, or is it actually at smaller banks who uh, are trying to compete or be more competitive? Yeah. So this is actually really exciting. What we first did, this came out of research I did in grad school. 
we went to the banks and said, give us your data. We're going to quantify this. And it turns out that the banks have very little data. So we need to create that data, which is where we pivoted, kept our head down and built the platform. Uh, so we have early pilot uh, revenue. The, that I don't really count as much. From the LOI question perspective, we have one consulting firm that we're testing with that has master service agreements in two Canadian financial institutions. So those contracts are depending, we're currently negotiating on them. It's usually between two to 300,000 in contract spend per contract. And there's multiple contracts being negotiated um, from the consulting project perspective. The LOIs from the US institution perspective, the bigger ones, uh, we currently aren't sure. We're negotiating those LOIs. We think that they'll be coming in within the next couple months, usually Q3, Q4 is what we have. Um, to give you a perspective, the big banks have usually between 200 to 300 million on the low end, and the banks that we're talking to have about two, one to three billion in spend that we would be automating from a revenue perspective, we're taking a percentage of that spend. Um, so the big banks are really interested but there's regulatory pressure. So new regulatory guidelines just came out um, in Canada and the US. And so everybody's having to do it. So we are also talking to um, one of the VCs that, that works with community banks and we're kind of trying to get in front of them as well. And there's a lot of interest there. We think that this is kind of a, a universal need, um, which is why there's been kind of so much excitement around what we're doing. That makes sense. All right. Yeah, I'm just jump in here quickly. Yes. I know we're trying, but I, where are you located? Um, yeah. And so I'm uh, a I'm a dual citizen, uh, fortunately. So currently, our team is in Toronto. We are incorporated. We have we have uh, we're incorporated in Canada, but we also have an incorporation in the United States. They're separate companies. It's not a sub. Uh, it's called a Delaware Canco Straddle. Uh, and so I am currently in the middle of figuring out where I'm going to be um, and where I need to be, whether that's San Francisco, which is kind of where I'm from, uh, whether it's New York or Charlotte, we're still trying to figure that out uh, in the next, that's kind of the next steps of what we're doing. Real quick, uh, what's the raise um, and what, what do you plan on doing with that capital? How will you allocate it? Yeah, so this is changing in real time because of how the conversations are changing with the banks. Um, we initially thought it was going to be a seed. Uh, we currently have a CVC who has stepped forward and said they would uh, lead our uh, Series A, um, given if we close one of those LOIs. Uh, so we have three banks who are in the lead for LOIs that we've said that the incentive would be that they get those settlement accounts and rails. So trying to push that to close a little bit faster. Um, and so it's, I know it's probably not good for a startup to sound like things are up in the air, but because of the size of these deals and the ask from the banks, things are shifting really quickly around the raise uh, and what that would look like. So it would, it really, depends on kind of how those are coming in and how those negotiate. So we're thinking of doing um, a bridge in the interim for an earlier stage um, VC who's looking to get in on that series, but we would want it to be uncapped given we know that a series is coming probably in the fall. Does that make sense? not the best answer. I wish things weren't changing so quickly. So I could, it used to be 5 million, but it's now looking like it's probably going to be more as these LOIs come in. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have four, four more startups uh, to pitch. Uh, so uh, are you guys in or out with this startup? Amen. All right. Congratulations. Two, two, two sharks. Hey. Well. Three sharks. Hey. Congrats. All right. Uh, well, moving on. Thank you so much. Thank Please you. Pay profile on our platform and support as a founders here and the, the next uh, person to pitch is deborah smith deborah you ready yes, yes i am thank you so very much okay. um yeah so my name is deborah i'm the ceo and founder of early groove 
We're a platform designed to address the pain point faced by SMBs, entrepreneurs, and creatives who are struggling to connect with their target audience and local communities in a free, safe, and trusted digital space. Today's ad-driven social media models have become a significant problem for our society, resulting in the spread of misinformation, privacy concerns, tech addiction, and amplification of harmful and polarizing content. And with a rising loneliness epidemic, mental health issues among children and teens, and communities fragmented by a lack of shared understanding, we've seized on this opportunity to build a new platform and business model focused on trust, privacy, and digital well-being. Unlike traditional ad-based social media, early grew of adopts a freemium B2B subscription model for SMBs and creators, while providing individuals with a free, ad-free platform that will use AI to maximize for user success rather than user engagement. SMBs and creators are searching for a one-stop shop where they can manage their content, build an authentic audience, and transact without the intrusion of ads, bots, or misinformation. To achieve this, users can sign up for free on our platform. They'll be able to get verified for free, create a business page to showcase their media, events, courses, job listings, and more. Premium subscription services will be offered um, with, the, with tools for them to be able to connect to third-party applications they're already using, um, such as event applications, booking, et cetera, and access payments, streamlining e-commerce and content distribution. Um, I'm located here in North Carolina. We've bootstrapped, launched a local pre-revenue MVP, conducted a pilot, onboarded and conducted in-depth discovery with 50 business customers. I had a group of Elon business school students helping with that um, last year. And then after that, we've experienced organic signups of over about 100 additional businesses. Um, but really, our next step is because what we've learned is, you know, without these premium features, we're just one more place that businesses right now have to put their content. So our next step is to raise a round where to build out the features to monetize our web app, build a consumer mobile app and scale out regionally using a campus based brand ambassador and other kind of gra grassroots community based go to market strategies working with chambers of commerce, which we already have, and, and leveraging entrepreneurial and nonprofit ecosystems as well. Okay, as time. Let's wrap it up. Yep. Okay, so last thing, we just, we understand the challenges of taking on industry giants that are determined to be the first ever humane technology alternative, fostering responsible technology usage to empower individuals to thrive while supporting a multi-billion dollar e-commerce marketplace for small businesses, creators, and entrepreneurs. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have three more uh, founders after Deborah, so hopefully we can make it uh, on time. All right, so dear Sharks, your questions. Does anyone wants to go first? Okay. Uh, uh, I was just gonna ask, can you talk to me about the team um, and their background? Sure, so um, I'm a solo founder and, but I have, two additional members on my team who've been working part-time. Um, one is a local business owner who's had several small businesses and has been working on our community engagement. Um, my youngest daughter, ha um, who's an artist and um, has been working in uh, arts education for several years with through public muse museums, um, has been serving as our um, working on our brand and marketing. Again, they're part-time. I've been working on this endeavor full-time. Um, my background is before starting Early Groove, I was a technology product manager for the University of Washington. I led from zero to, to um, co commercialization, the development of a, a privacy focused um, ed tech app, a course evaluation app that we um, commercialize and license to other um, colleges and universities across the country. Thank you so much. Are there any sharks in or out? Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. We're moving on. Uh, please support other founders. And uh, um, uh, and the next person to present is Andre Dilonek. Andre, are you ready? Hello, Andre. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Andre Dilonek. I am a CEO and founder of Cartami, mobile application and the next generation of uh, payment cards uh, for all payments and loyalty schemes. Uh, um, all of us uh, have a lot of uh, different bank cards uh, and we use it uh, for everyday purchase, but uh, this card can identify us as a payers only for bank, not for retailers. 
to identify ourselves in the retailers, we need another way to identify ourselves. It's uh, maybe plastic loyalty card uh, or mobile application or tell your phone number. It's situation, uh, uh, another side of this situation is when as a customer, I'm alone, but I have a lot of different identifiers in different retailers. Uh, it's same uh, as you, you have a different passport for different countries uh, to travel. Uh, what, what we do, our mobile application, uh, um, uh, when the uh, customer load our application and uh, enter his personal details, our application generate ID uh, as a barcode. And after we integrate this barcode into in two ways, into the retailer's loyalty program in different, different retailers and into the bank card in the same time. And uh, in um, our, our customers have an opportunity to have a discount and make a payment with only one card in one action. I show you this card. It's card with my ID, uh, my personal ID. Uh, the, the, this card is a brand of the year by Visa. Uh, our, our partner is uh, Visa. Uh, uh, we brand of the year because of our record sales. Uh, we sell more than uh, 20,000 cards uh, uh, over five months. Uh, our customer acquisition cost only nine cents uh, because it's very interesting for people have uh, cards uh, for uh, for all for payments and for lo for pro loyalty programs. We uh, we sell this card not as another bank card. It's a universal loyalty card with payment function. Um, we now we have um, more than. Uh, 1,500 uh, users uh, and our uh, partnership uh, chain grow every day. We have more than 20 biggest retailers uh, in our country uh, as a partners uh, from different uh, areas. It's uh, supermarket, hypermarkets, uh, pet shops, pharmacies, boots, clothes, all. Yeah, in all these chains, you can use- Wait, the, you pass the, time. Uh, Please wrap it up. Uh, Thank it's uh, simple for all of us. Uh, thank you for your, for your attention. Please, uh, I'm ready to answer. Yeah, Sharks, your questions. The product of the year at Visa. Okay. Um, how much are you currently raising? How much have you raised thus far? And from who? Now we raise uh, $5 million uh, to move on the foreign markets. Uh, we have a long period for starting because we need some time to integrate uh, some retailers and integrate one brand. Uh, and after we we need uh, uh, and uh, we need this money only for uh, advertising, only for marketing, uh, for promotion. Uh, we our software are complete, uh, and uh, we need only money for promotion. So you're looking for $5 million. Yes. I take it you're to only for marketing. Yes, only for marketing. Yes, we, we try to move in uh, several markets uh, because in this case, uh, you uh, understand that when you move uh, between the countries and in all countries, uh, you use only one ID. For example, you move from America to Germany and uh, with the same card, with the same ID, uh, use uh, your bonuses uh, uh, in another country. For, from Germany, go to Poland, for example, from Poland to uh, Ukraine. And in all countries, you can use only one, this ID, and use only one payment card because your ID integrate in the retailer's loyalty programs and uh, you have uh, opportunity to have a bonuses. It's very interesting features for all uh, customers. Uh, we have a great results, uh, and we think that the, 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 this card will be in all wallets. Uh, okay. One of card is uh, usually uh, will be one of uh, it will be a card to me. Are there any sharks in the city? Okay. Go, go. okay. Other question: um, Is there going to be a like? Can I upload it to my digital wallet? Their ability yes, to do that yet? Yes, uh, yes. Now, now we integrate. Uh, now we have a project with Visa. Uh, Visa have technology digital skin. Now we start integrate 
this ID into the uh, dig digital card. And uh, it will be the same mechanic when you open your wallet, uh, see a picture in, in the phone with uh, this card uh, and with your uh, ID, show this ID for cashier, cashier scan it, and you pay by phone in the same mechanic as a plastic card. Super quick question, super quick. Where are you, where's the company domiciled and what are you raising under? Uh, we raised um, uh, one and a half of a million dollars uh, from Angel Investor. Uh, Where's the company domiciled? Uh, we have, we, we have, uh, um, excuse me, maybe. <laughs> Where's the company headquartered? Uh, uh, headquartered in Delaware. Uh, we have company in Delaware and have account in uh, American Bank. Okay. Are there any sharks interested to connect? I guess in or out? I would like to connect. Yeah. I'd like to talk more. Yeah, me too. Thank, you, thank you guys so much. Thank you for opportunity. Congratulations. Three sharks are in and we're moving on. Uh, Andre, please uh, have your profile on the platform. Uh, yes. uh, the next, uh, we have two sharks, uh, two, two founders left. And the next would be Tino Go. Tino, are you ready? Go for it. Yeah, I am. Hi, uh, my name is Tino Go. I'm the CEO and founder of Baru. So uh, a few years ago, I looked for a bookcase and couldn't find one that fit my space in my house. And when I tried to get one made, I was frustrated that modern manufacturing technology hasn't improved the medieval process of getting custom cabinetry ordered, made, and delivered. So that inefficiency also arises with large building construction projects. These multi-million and half a billion dollar buildings, design is still disconnected from manufacturing so what we've built is we're using um, the existing technology to build a shared economy virtual manufacturer leveraging existing but underused machines to eliminate all of the soft costs of construction as well as all of the freight and warehousing costs that typically wastes 40 percent of industry revenues so we're starting with cabinetry and furniture it's a 35 billion dollar tam that wastes 15 billion dollars every single year on shipping and handling and so um we're launched. We've uh, proven our technology works in 30 cities around the country. Uh, we have $1.5 million in the sales pipeline. We're starting to sell to multifamily. All of those sales have been bootstrapped uh, essentially through me. Uh, and I've got a fabulous team. Um, we're ready to scale. Yeah, my my background is corporate finance. And so I've, I've led companies from 12 million that we scaled built 85 million during the time I was there. And my last full-time role was overseeing a $1.2 billion business unit of a German chemical company. We've earned two patents for using augmented and virtual reality to control that manuf those manufacturing instructions. And we're building our marketplace. Um, I'd love to talk more and, you know, with you more and explain. Appreciate that. Uh... Uh, right on time uh, so we have one left founder after this one and then we will let investors to wrap this session up so what's your questions dear sharks i'll be fast i'm interested yeah i'm in as well on that one oh marika you too okay three, three sharks in four sharks in Cuddy. what about the rest i'm wondering if we ever have a jackpot today or not <laughs> four five, five sharks in okay but oh, it's okay, jackpot. <laughs> Congratulations. So Thank you. we will connect. Fantastic. Uh, so yeah, please stay till the end. So have a profile on the global world and support other founders. And we are moving on to the final uh, final startup, uh, Alex Bezutsev. Alex, are you ready? Yes, yes, yes. You're the final um, leader. You got two minutes. All right, I feel like we're on the fifth floor. We're headed to the first, so I'll be quick with my elevator pitch. Um, so my name is Alex. I'm the founder and CEO of My Mechanic. Uh, think Uber and requesting roadside assistance for truck drivers. Right now, when they break down, uh, they go on Google, they go on all these directories, they call and they hope and they wait. Our platform is a two-sided platform that will service the trucking companies, the fleets, the owner operators. And on the other side, it will uh, facilitate a platform management system for the vendors and um, owner operator vendors as well. And so our goal is to connect the two, literally what Uber did to requesting a cab. And we're the first ones to, uh, we have no competition actually, surprisingly enough, but um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, dear Sharks, your questions.
Are there any questions from the sharks? I like the back. Uh, I like the analogy. Um, that was easy for us to understand. Uh, what is your background? Why is your team the best to make this happen? Right. Uh, so my background is I did consulting for fleets and trucking companies, and we came across this um, off-market deal that I went out and raised uh, eight point five million for. And throughout the process of facilitating and up, uh, firing up the shop, we started getting a lot of road calls and. We had started our own roadside company and it was such a manual process. And there's many people that are trying their own click, but you have to go join their platform, their own company. And we're gonna be a neutral base. That's uh, a platform for everyone. So we're about, I've uh, been bootstrapping it and we're about a hundred thousand in. We just had some great calls yesterday. We talked to Warner Enterprises. We've talked to Ryder, we've talked to Estes. Uh, we got a great team. We got um, XCO of Celadon on board. We have another uh, advisor that just sold its company to Omni for 200 million. And um, we're in development right now and there's nobody that's really competing with us. And so I strongly feel like, you know, even if there are us, Lyft needed Uber, but um, we have a great concept that we've talked to many fleets and vendors and we put together um, the, the structure for. How much is that um, guy that sold his company for 200 million? How much is he putting into your company? Uh, he's just an advisor. I've been bootstrapping myself waiting for a, a safe note uh, investor. Unfortunately, I have to run at top of hour, but I'm interested. So, Alex, um, add me to the gear list. I will. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Chris, it's just your final words to the founders. If you got, got to jump off, just your words of wisdom. Uh, so we'd like to speak as well. Uh, this was just spectacular, impressive. Uh, you know, thank you for you know putting out your vulnerability, talking about your businesses. It's never it's always uh, scary and fun, et cetera. Uh, I'm really impressed. I see, you know, all of us on the panel see a ton of companies. This was really good quality. Uh, keep doing the work. Uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, you know, it feels like lots and lots of sprints, but just uh, uh, keep it up, keep trying, keep working. All right. Thank you, Grace. It was great having you and hope to see you on our next speech once too. All right. Have, you, have a great day. Thank you. And uh, Jeffrey, you had a question. Hey, Alex, uh, talk hey. to you about how, how many uh, customers you have right now. Right, so we're um, about to launch MVP in about two weeks, and we have currently 800 pre-subscribed vendors. Um, and I'll be honest, we didn't really have a hard time signing people on. People just want to see the product, so we stopped selling about three weeks ago. Stop, um, but I still go to convention shows, and um, we're still onboarding, pre-onboarding uh, big fleets. Largest vendors? Can you share? Yeah, so I mean, yesterday we talked talk to uh, Werner. That's a publicly traded multi-billion-dollar company. Uh, we talked to, uh, uh, sorry. Do you have any contracts signed? Uh, no, we just started talking with them. We have one LOI with Uship. That's about 20,000 carriers there. Cool. I'm right. in. I love I love this. So. All right, Thank fantastic. You. Are there any sharks in? So Jeffrey is in. Fantastic. Are there more sharks? So Marika, you too? OK. Yeah, I'll jump in as well. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Three sharks in. Congratulations. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, great job. And we are closing this session because some sharks got to jump off. Um, and uh, I would let Ben speak first uh, to, before other investors. So yeah, I can let you go. So Ben, your final words of wisdom, your recommendation. Yeah. Um, I just want to say everybody did a great job. Um, the talent was um, was really high. Um, and yeah, I just I just think, you know, don't don't underestimate yourself as an LGBTQ plus founder. Always remember that you are just as good as everybody else. Right. See you guys. Bye. Thank you, Ben. I think we nailed it, guys, right? So it was a fantastic event. I'm so grateful for anyone supported us. I really appreciate that we have gathered together and did this event. So dear investors, now this is your uh, floor. Please uh, we'll close the session and uh, let's uh, uh, let's wrap this up. Marika, you want to go first? Yeah, I think I can uh, definitely sing the praises as well and join the, the others in saying that it was very nice to be here. Like for me, it was the first time joining an event like this. So uh, it was very nice to, to learn from the sharks and see uh, you guys pitch from across the pond and uh, enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Marika, for uh staying with us and uh, we will connect uh, with anyone you chose and everyone will be connected of course uh, and they appreciate your feedback dear jeffrey your turn just want to uh thank uh both the panelists um and the presenters today um happy pride month to everybody 
Um, if, you know, for whatever reason, we didn't raise your hand to, to continue the conversation, feel free to drop us a note. Um, I always try to give founders, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes. I'm happy to share advices or wisdom, um, or maybe I can connect you to somebody that can help you get to the next step. Uh, we're here to help. We're not, we're not here to hinder. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that and uh, great to have you. Thank you, Chris. Please, your turn. Yeah, I think everyone basically said what I would have said. Um, feel free to reach out um, at any time if I can be helpful. Um, you know, um, message me on LinkedIn or connect with me through the organizers. Thank you. We will definitely connect you. Thank you uh, for your feedback and uh, we will definitely uh, happy to work with all of you guys. Uh, Kari, uh, no pressure on you, but you'll be the closing the global session of LGBTQ <laughs> to stop with sharks. <laughs> no pressure, <laughs> joking. <laughs> Keep saying no pressure, it means pressure. Um, no, great job to the panelists. Happy Pride Month, first and foremost. Um, it takes a lot of courage, one, as an entrepreneur to be out there and to do in the nitty gritty work, but also as an underrepresented founder. And just remember, like, being underrepresented is not our um, downfall, it is actually our strength. So use that um, and be true to who you are when you're pitching and when you're talking to people. Um, so yeah, great job. Would love to connect. Uh, same as Jeffrey to echo his words, like we're here to help, um, not hinder. Um, I'm all about giving. I'm a very straightforward person. I was entre entrepreneur myself. I had a tech startup that I launched and now I'm on the VC side. So um, yeah, just continue to put that, put your foot, best foot forward and just know that you have the support from many organizations. I would echo what Jeff has said many times. Startout is a great organization. There's other organizations to like look into that will help support you in your endeavor. And so I, I highly recommend that you do that. Fantastic. What a, uh, what a fine funnel we had. And we had, we, we've just uh, nailed this event for the Pride goals. And we had amazing founders to get, uh, today pitching us a great idea. So I'm so grateful to the panel, to the startups, and uh, for everyone who was supporting us uh, creating this event. It wasn't easy. It was easier to create a general pitch event, but. Uh, narrow uh, events or like uh, targeted events are my way harder so i think we did a great job all together and uh, all the connections happen today we will follow up on this today or tomorrow so don't worry we will connect you via email also you can find uh, all these investors and other investors on google world platform so create your profiles and start matching also rsvp to the next pitch event that will happen on july 14th we'll have a break my team is a little uh tired <laughs> doing this every week so they are begging for some break so definitely they need to rest and um so we will have three weeks break and uh, please uh, support us on social media please uh, uh share it so we don't want to pay google for advertising to bring you guys here you should support us so we make it free for all of you it, because this is the way it should, it should be and of course the final thing i want everyone to do uh please give us your feedback there is a feedback form right here in the chat Anything you say, we read, and if there is, there is opportunity to make something better, we definitely will. Thank you so much. Have a great Pride Month, and let's be in touch. Take care, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye.